Welcome back to Calculus 3. I'm Dr. Jeff Groh. Today, we're going to talk about Stokes Theorem. It goes like this. Suppose S is a surface with boundary curve. Not any surface is an orientable And since it's orientable, it will have a unit normal field. Since we have this unit normal field, we are also going to give an orientation to the boundary curve. And we want to orient the boundary curve in a way consistent with the right hand rule. The right hand rule says that if you go around following the orientation of that curve with your hand, then your thumb will point in the direction of the normal field that you have assigned. So we're going to orient the boundary curve. The boundary of the surface is this curve. consistent with N and the right hand rule. The C1 on an open set containing both the surface and the boundary curve. Then the following is true. If you integrate around that closed loop boundary, circulation you'll get the same thing if you integrate across the entire surface the curl of F dot in the S the circulation version of Green's theorem that we gave earlier was called Stokes theorem in the plane for good reason for Stokes' theorem in the plane, the surface S and its boundary are regions in the plane. And the normal that vector that we chose was K going in the direction of the z-axis, poking out of the plane. Clearly, for all points in the xy plane, the normal vector can be taken to be K. In our proof, we'll let our vector field f have coordinate functions m, n, and p. And we'll let our unit normal field have coordinates n1, n2, and n3. Note then that f can be decomposed into m0, 0, plus 0, n, 0, plus 0, 0, p. That allows us to decompose the integral on the left-hand side. As three line integrals. The first is just m dx. And then we'll have n dy and, of course, p e dz. In our proof, 
going to begin by letting f be m n p. Then note that the integral around the boundary of the surface f dot dr may be expressed in the following way. We can break the integral up into separate pieces. For the integral on the other side of the equation, let tu cross tv be the vector n1, n2, n3. Let's check out that curl. This will be by minus nz comma negative ex minus mz comma nx minus my. Taking the components of our curl and dotting, we'll have the integral of, we'll have py minus nz times n1 minus px minus mz times n2 plus nx minus my n3 and then all of that times du dv. Collecting terms involving m will have a positive mz in 2 minus my in 3. Those terms involving n will be nx in 3 minus nz in 1. And those terms involving p will have py in 1 minus px in 2 all times du dv. We have now decomposed the integrals on each side into terms involving m, a term involving n, and a term involving p. It is enough to show that the integral around the boundary of our surface of m dx is the integral on the surface of mz in 2 minus my in 3 du dv. The other four terms will follow in a similar fashion. On this piece, we'll suppose that the surface is expressible in the form z equals a function of x and y. That gives us a parameterization in terms of x and y equal to x, y, f of x comma y. The x tangent vector will be 1, 0, f x, and the y tangent vector will be 0, 1, f y. It follows then that tx cross ty will be minus fx. Don't forget the minus on the middle cofactor. We get minus fy and then 1. The integral on s of mz in 2 minus my in 3 dv, given that tx cross ty is minus fx minus fy1 will be the integral over the domain of parameters for this parameterization of 
the derivative with respect to z, m evaluated at x, y on the surface, f of x comma y, and n2 will be minus the derivative of f with respect to y. Then we have minus the derivative with respect to y of m, still on the same parameterization, times n3. In this case, n3 is 1, dx dy. Factoring the negative out for what's left over, you can see a chain rule going on. This is going to be the derivative with respect to y of the function m evaluated at x, y, f of x, comma, y, dy, dx. Let's express this as a double integral, which it surely will be. The domain of parameters is a collection of points in R2. We basically have a situation where we might be able to apply Green's theorem at this point if we can phrase it properly. What we'll do is we'll set the vector field f to be m comma zero. Let's look at the curl of the vector field f. We're going to evaluate m just as it is in the integral below. So it will only depend upon x and y in this formulation. We'll have 0, 0 because m no longer depends upon z, and then minus the derivative with respect to y of m evaluated in exactly this way. We have that minus right here. It follows then that we have here the integral over this domain d of the curl of the fancy vector field f dot k dx dy, which is the area element in the plane. We deduce then by Green's theorem that what we have here is the integral around the boundary of that domain D of the vector field F dotted with dr. Let's see what that is. That's the integral around the boundary of D of m still evaluated at x, y, f of x comma y times dx since the other coordinate of f is zero. But this last integral is the same as the integral around the boundary of the surface of m dx, because when we integrate around the boundary of the surface, we have to evaluate m on the surface. The other coordinates follow similarly, so this completes the proof. Let's verify Stokes' theorem, and there's two ways to properly pronounce this. They're both correct. You may either say Stokes' theorem or Stokes' theorem. It seems that both are valid ways of pronouncing this theorem. Let's let our vector field f be z, x, y squared. And let's let s be given by z equals 4 minus x squared minus y squared. And we'll take the portion of that surface with z greater than or equal to 0. This is an elliptic paraboloid intersecting the xy plane in a circle of radius 2 and peaking out at a height of 4. The boundary curve is this little circle. If we have an orientation on the boundary curve going around this way, then the unit normals had better poke upward with a positive z component. 
We want to verify Stokes' theorem. You're going to have a problem like this both on exam four and also on the final exam. So I want to make sure that the very first thing that you do is write down the formula. I'll give you some credit just for writing down the formula. Let me record some of the relevant information for this problem over here. Let's do the right hand side first. On the right hand side, the first thing we need to do is calculate the curl. We'll have 2y. We get minus z, but there's another minus, so we end up with plus z for the middle cofactor and then 1. To parameterize the surface, we should take note that there's a rotational symmetry around the z-axis. That means we should use cylindrical coordinates, where x is equal to r cosine theta, y is equal to r sine theta, and z will be 4 minus r squared. Our tangent vectors are going to be cosine, sine, negative 2r, and negative r sine, r cosine 0. So that tr cross t theta will be 2r squared cosine. We have subtracting a product of two negatives and then flipping the sign. If you're keeping track, that's four minus signs. So we end up with a positive 2 r squared sine. Then we have r cosine squared minus a negative, that's plus, r sine squared, which simplifies, due to the Pythagorean identity, as r. The domain of parameters projecting the surface down in the xy plate will be this disk of radius 2. That means theta will go from 0 to 2 pi, and r will go from 0 to 2 we'll dot tr cross t theta with our curl and evaluate on the surface. We'll have 2y times 2r squared cosine. z times 2r squared sine and then plus r dr d theta. There are some things you can notice right away. By Fubini's theorem, you may reverse the order of the integration. And if you integrate sine from 0 to 2 pi, you get nothing from the middle term. The same is true for the first term, 2 sine cosine. Is, by the double angle identity, the sine of 2 theta. The period is... 2 pi over 2, or just pi, which means we're integrating over two periods. That means we get doubly nothing. That leaves only r dr d theta. We get a 2 pi for free, and that leaves us with 4 pi. We now need to calculate the path integral on the other side. Before we do that, let me record our answer from the right-hand side. The integral on the left-hand side is a path integral. So the first thing you have to do is parameterize the path. On the right-hand side, you'll remember that when we calculated tr cross t theta, the z component was 1, which means that the vectors were pointing up above the surface, not below. That means we have to parameterize the boundary curve that lies in the xy plane, by the way, in a way that is consistent 
with the normal vectors that we found on the other part. And so the boundary curve will be parameterized by R of t equals, it's a circle of radius 2, 2 cosine t, 2 sine t, and then 0. F, you'll recall, was z x y squared. That's going to give us z dx plus x dy plus y squared dz. From the parameterization and the fact that z is equal to zero, we quickly deduce that two of these terms are going to go away. With what's left over, we have x dy, and this is going to be a curve in the plane we'll end up with the area of the disk enclosed by that curve in the plane, an area of a disk of radius 2. The answer is obviously 4 pi. But let's go through this anyway. We're going to choose t values between 0 and 2 pi so that our integral becomes the integral from 0 to 2 pi of x times dy. We have a 4 that can be brought out, and then cosine squared. Cosine squared is 1 half times 1 plus the cosine of 2t. Cosine of 2t has a period of pi, and we're integrating over two periods. So we get nothing. So we end up with 2 times the length of the interval times 1. And that is 4 pi. And that's a big check. The line integral on the left is equal to the surface integral on the right. In our next example, we're going to set f to be minus y squared z x. And our surface is going to be defined to be the portion of 2x plus 2y plus z equals 6 in the first octant. What kind of surface is this? Since all the powers on x, y, and z are 1, this is a very flat thing. It's a plane. We can see that if y and z are 0, then x is 3. If x and z are 0, then y is 3. And if x and y are 0, then z is 6. Three points determine a plane. And so we get the portion of the plane slicing off a little triangle in the first octant. The surface is that triangle. The boundary of the surface consists of three line segments. So, we're verifying Stokes' Theorem again. The first thing you should do, remember, is to write down Stokes' Theorem. I want you to get in the habit of writing down that formula. So we're going to integrate around the boundary of the surface f dot dr. That will give you the same thing as the surface integral of the curl of f dot n ds. Let's record someplace on the board the vector field and our surface. The vector field has coordinates minus y squared z and x, and the surface is 2x plus 2y plus z equals 6. Let's do the right hand side first. After all, the left hand side involves three little curves. That means three path intervals. Let's do the right-hand side first. We had minus y squared z and then x. The curl will be minus 1. We get a minus on the middle cofactor so we get another minus 1. 
and then we're subtracting so we get a positive 2y. Now our parametrized surface, we can solve for z most easily. So we get 6 minus 2x minus 2y for z. Our tangent vectors are going to be tx equal to 1, 0, minus 2. ty will be 0, 1, minus 2. And then tx cross ty will be positive 2. Another positive 2 because we switched the sign on the middle cofactor. And then followed by 1. We need to take the dot product of this vector and the curl. We'll be integrating over the domain of x's and y's, this little triangle, the dot product. That's negative 2, and negative 2 is negative 4, and then positive 2y. We'll write dy dx, the domain of parameters is this little triangle, 3 on each side. So x will go from 0 to 3. Using vertical cross-sections, we'll go from lower curve, which is y equals 0, to upper curve, which is a straight line with intercept 3 and slope minus 1. Let's express that as 3 minus x. Integrating with respect to y, we have negative 4y plus y squared evaluated from 0 to 3 minus x. That's negative 4 times 3 minus x plus 3 minus x quantity squared dx. On this next integral, I want you to try to do the u substitution in your head. If u is equal to 3 minus x, then du is minus dx. So we'll get a positive 4, 3 minus x squared over 2, and a minus 3 minus x cubed over 3. Plugging in 3, we get 0. And then we plug in 0. When we plug in 0, we'll have 3 squared times 2, which is 18. And then 3 cubed divided by 3 is 9. The answer is minus 9. We'll preserve that answer over here. We now need to do the path integrals for the other side of Stokes' theorem. Let's break these curves into curve 1, curve 2, and curve 3. On curve 1, x starts at 3 and ends at 0. y starts at 0 and ends at 3. We can parameterize that as 3 minus t and t. z is 0 all the way across, and t will run from 0 to 3. That way, when t is 0, we're at 3, 0, 0, and when t is 3, we're at 0, 3, 0, the other end of the line segment. Integrating on c1, our vector field, which you'll recall, was minus y squared z x, which we're dotting with dr. That's the integral on c1 of minus y squared dx plus z dy plus x dz on the curve z is 0. So we'll integrate from 0 to 3 minus y squared. dx is minus dt. We get 3 cubed over 3, which is 3 squared, and that's 9. So we get 9 on curve 1. On curve 2, x is 0 all the way across y goes from 3 to 0, and so we'll express that as 3 minus t. z goes from 0 to 6. 2t will work there. t runs from 0 to 3. 
If you're wondering how to parameterize these, there is a trick that will help some of you. The idea is at t equals zero, we need z equal to zero. And at t equals three, we need z equal to six. You can use the formula for the straight line. z minus zero equals the slope. 6 minus 0 over 3 minus 0 times t minus 0. That gives you z equals 2t. For the other coordinate, you want at t equals 0, y to be 3, and at t equals 3, y to be 0. You can use the same trick. y minus 3 equals the slope. 0 minus 3 over 3 minus 0 times t minus 0. You get y equals moving the 3 over 3. The ratio here is minus 1 and then t. We are integrating on c2 minus y squared dx plus z dy plus x dz. x on this piece is 0. So we get the integral from 0 to 3, z, which is 2t, times dy, which is negative dt. So we get negative t squared evaluated from 0 to 3, or negative 9. On curve 1, we had positive 9. On curve 2, we have negative 9. So far, we have a net of 0. We'd better get negative 9 on c3. Now we need to work on c3. I have to tell you, a lot of my students in the past have had trouble with these parameterizations. So if you're not quite following along, you might want to pause the tape and then work through this carefully in the fashion that we worked the, the last one if necessary. On curve 3, it's y that's 0 all the way across. And x goes from 0 to 3. So we'll make x equal to t, and t run from 0 to 3. Now, z goes from 6 to 0. 6 minus 2t would work there. Again, we're integrating minus y squared dx plus z dy plus x dz, where y is 0. We have the integral from 0 to 3. We'll have x, which is t, times dz, which is negative 2 dt. We'll have negative t squared evaluated from 0 to 3, and that's negative 9. It follows, then, that the integral around the boundary of the surface will be 9 minus 9 minus 9, which is minus 9. That checks with the other side. I'd like to talk to you for a few moments about Maxwell's laws. I know that this is not a course in physics, but physics is a sponsor of a lot of what we do here in mathematics. It motivates a lot of mathematics. And you might want to see some of the connections between the divergence theorem and Stokes theorem and electromagnetism. I want to begin with some notation. Let capital Phi F of S denote the flux of the vector field F through the surface S. We'll begin with Gauss's law for electricity. We're assuming that charged particles produce an electric field. Now, let's suppose that we have some region in space, R, that has a boundary surface. The surface is going to be closed going to contain some finite region in space. 
Gauss's law for electricity states that the flux of the electric the flux of the electric field is proportional to the total charge. Q is the total charge that lies within the region R, which can be calculated in the following way. You integrate over all of R a density times a volume element. Rho is charge density. Rho will have units of coulombs per cubic meter. If we take coulombs per cubic meter and multiply it by cubic meters, we get coulombs. Added up over the entire region, we get the total number of coulombs, and that's denoted by Q. So we have here 1 over epsilon naught, the integral on R of rho dV. On the left, we have the flux of the electric field through the surface, which is the boundary of the region. But by the divergence theorem, we can convert the flux integral into a volume integral of the divergence of the electric field. So now we have two integrals of the same type equal to each other. We can write these as a single integral if we wish. The region R was arbitrary. If the integrand is continuous, if it's ever non-zero, then there must be some region around that where it remains non-zero, in which case you could choose the region so that you would get a positive result or a negative result. We deduce then by the vanishing integrals principle, since this is zero for all regions, that it implies that the integrand is zero. Moving the divergence to the other side, we get the divergence of the electric field is one over epsilon naught times the charge density rho. This is a differential form of Gauss's law for electricity. Gauss's law for magnetism is just as easy. In fact, it's even easier. It says the flux of the electric field through any surface, which is the boundary of some region, is identically zero. So we get zero is the integral around the boundary of the region. The electric field is usually denoted by B. So its flux is like this by the divergence theorem. That's equal to the integral on R of the divergence of B dV. Again, by the vanishing integrals principle, if the integrand were non-zero at some point and continuous, you could choose R to a small enough region that you would remain positive or negative. It follows then that since you get zero for all regions, that the integrand, the divergence of B, must be identically zero. Remember the Helmholtz theorem? Every vector field can be expressed as a gradient of a scalar potential plus a curl of a vector potential. This part was curl-free and this part divergence-free. So this part has all of the divergence and none of the curl. This part has all of the curl, none of the divergence. So vector fields can be decomposed into two parts, one with non-zero divergence and the other with non-zero curl. If you can describe the divergence and curl of a vector field, then you get both parts. And what is more, Helmholtz theorem asserts, there is no third part. This will describe the entire vector field. So far, we have the divergence of the electric field is 1 over epsilon naught times rho. And the divergence of the magnetic field is identically 0. 
we're getting that divergence part of both the electric and the magnetic fields. What's required to complete a description of these fields is some description of their curl. And that's what we'll do next. You might have done this experiment before, but if you have an electric wire and you move a magnet next to it, that can induce a current in the wire. A current, a circulation of electric particles. Let's suppose that we have some surface and it has a boundary curve this time. Let's talk about the circulation, which is added up around the boundary of the electric field. According to Faraday's law of induction, the circulation of that electric current is minus the time rate of change of the flux of the magnetic field through the surface. We can do something on each side of this equation. We can apply Stokes' theorem on the left to get the integral over the entire surface of the curl of the electric field, dot n ds. On the right-hand side, it's minus the time rate of change of the flux. That's b dot n ds. Both integrals are of the same kind. We need to pass the derivative into the integral. When we do, we get a partial derivative because b will depend upon x, y, z, and t, and then that dot n ds. We deduce then that the curl of the electric field is equal to minus the time rate of change of the magnetic field. This will, together with Gauss's law for electricity, divergence E is 1 over epsilon naught rho, give a complete description of the electric field once we also have a complete description of the magnetic field. What's needed is a description of the circulation of the magnetic field. So envision for a moment a wire. The magnetic field will go around the wire, especially if there's a current flowing through it. So let's talk about the circulation. So let's put our surface right here going around the wire. That's our surface S, and this is the boundary of the surface. So around the boundary of the surface, we'll talk about the circulation of the magnetic field. That should surely be relate, related to the flux of the current through the wire. How do I express the flux of that current? We're going to have a term mu naught times the flux of the current through S. But there's one more term. The one additional term is of the form mu naught epsilon naught times the time rate of change of the flux of the electric field through that surface. Yes, a changing electric flux can cause a change in that, can induce a um, the curl in that magnetic field. So a changing electric flux can also change the circulation of the electric field. By Stokes' theorem, on the left-hand side, we can integrate across all of F the curl of B dot N dS. On the right-hand side, we'll factor the mu naught out. We'll have epsilon naught times the integral over S of the time rate of change, the time rate of change of E with respect to T dot NDS, and then plus the uh, integral 
on S of J dot NBS, where J is the current. Equating the integrands on both sides, we have the curl of the magnetic field is mu naught times epsilon naught times the time rate of change of the electric field plus the current. Putting these all together, we have the divergence of E is 1 over epsilon naught rho. The divergence of B is 0. The curl of E is minus the time rate of change of B. And the curl of B is mu naught epsilon naught the time rate of change of the electric field plus the current. By Helmholtz theorem, you would expect that the magnetic and electric fields would be described by at least these four equations, giving the divergence and curl of each, and that these would give a complete description of those vector fields. You have to give all four because they're related to each other.